26th Bill Tank Advisory Committee meeting on May 20th, 2021 at 9 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. My name is Joanna Fito, Chief of the Environmental Management Division, sitting in for Chair Keith Tall Oka, who is unable to join us today. Logistics for this meeting will be covered by Peter Adler as soon as I'm done with introductions and duties at the FTAC. The members of the FTAC include from our congressional delegation, from the office of US, U.S. Senator Brian Schatz's office, Ms. Dale Hahn, representing U.S. Senator Macy Hirono's office, Mr. Carlos Santana, from U.S. Representative Ed Case's office, Ms. Jacqueline Conant, and from new U.S. Representative Kai Ali'i Kahele, Ms. Ms. Haname Niloy, and team. From our state legislature, we have Senator Mike Gabbard, Chair of the Agriculture and Environment Committee, and Representative Nicole Lowen, Chair of the Energy and Environmental Protection Committee. From the Department of Defense, U.S. Navy, Captain Gordy Meyer, Commanding Officer of NASA Hawaii, Regional Engineer. Our subject matter experts from the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Deputy Director Kaleo Manuel. Manager and Chief Engineer of the Board of Water Supply, Ernest Lau. And Ryan Imata, Civil Engineer from the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Commission on Water Resource Management. Our public members include Dr. Melanie Lau of the Moanalua Valley Community Association, and our Aliyah Manu Salt Lake Neighborhood Board representative is absent. From the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 9, we have Stephen Lindner, Red Hill Project Coordinator. And with me are Department of Health representatives that I will introduce themselves as they come up. The purpose of, oh, we're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> okay, uh, for clarification, the times that are listed on the agenda are for our planning purpose. Uh, we are going to go either faster or slower than listed, so please be aware of that. Uh, I will continue on with our 910 item, which is review the duties of the FCAP. The purpose of the committee is listed on page four of the agenda and is presented in Hawaii Revised Statute, Chapter 342L, Section 62. Since the start of the FTAC, membership of the committee and scope has changed from the statutory requirements. The U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force no longer own or operate field constructed tanks and therefore are not represented at the meeting. Two members of the congressional delegation while present have opted out of being official members due to potential conflict of interest. That would be Senator Schatz and Representative Case. Schofield Barracks is listed in statute, but because there are no field constructed tanks at this location, its facility has been removed from further discussion. This is the first FTAC meeting after a commitment to semi-annual versus annual meeting, as requested by the committee members. After the last FTAC and before this meeting, the Navy posted an audio cast update on their website. The video recording of the first Zoom meeting and first meeting with the facilitator is available to the public. Again, the Department of Health is committed to conducting the FTAC twice a year. As of the last FTAC meeting on October 30, 2020, based on information provided by the water purveyors, drinking water monitoring, the drinking water at Red Hill Shaft, Halava, and Moanalua meets all state and federal drinking water standards and continues to be safe to drink. At this time, I'm going to introduce Peter S. Adler, PhD, who also facilitated last year's FTEC. As a, he is a planner, mediator, facilitator, and principal of Accord 3.0, 
a professional network of consultants specializing in foresight, strategy, and cooperative troubleshooting. Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Good to see some of you back from our last meeting and uh, aloha to lots of friends and colleagues who are on here. So just to, I want to just make sure everybody understands that I have been retained by the Department of Health to make these meetings as uh, productive and uh, thoughtful as I can. I have no disputes with anybody. I propose to be a friend to all and just make my focus the conduct of this meeting. Uh, I also want to introduce um, Megan Brotherton. Megan, raise your hand, if you would. Megan yeah. is our Zoom person. I'm gonna ask her in a minute just to run through our Zoom protocols. In fact, why don't you go ahead and do that, uh, Megan, and then I'll come back to what we're gonna do today. Okay, this is just a, a little bit of technical housekeeping. I'll be um, working behind the scenes to make sure things run as smoothly as possibly with the technical aspects of Zoom. So you've noticed you're all muted upon entry. If you do have a, um, a part where you need to speak, please unmute yourself and then remute yourself afterward to avoid any unnecessary background noise. Um, we may mute all during the meeting if there's some kind of background noise that's causing a disturbance. So please just take that as a as a precautionary thing and no, no disrespect is intended with that. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, but if you would like to make your own local recording on your own computer, please uh, send me a quick message in chat. I am listed under the Solid and Hazardous Waste Branch co-host designation with um, my name, Megan, behind it, and I can enable you. You will need to have a a uh, regular computer, desktop or laptop, because Zoom does not support local recording to iOS or Android devices. Uh, later on in the meeting, there will be the public comment period and we will have a, um, a countdown screen available just for timing awareness. So everyone will be able to be mindful of the timing of their public comments. If you have any technical issues or questions, please don't hesitate to shoot me a quick chat. Thank you all. Yes, and uh, as you'll see, we are going to always take questions for information and clarification, first both from the committee and then later on uh, in the meeting from the public, and then comments. If you have questions, put them in the chat and you know indicate it's a question for information or clarification. Just put question and uh, state that is, and then we'll come back to that. And Megan's going to help me keep track of a lot of that. So thank you, everybody. Here's, you've all seen the agenda. And we, as Joanna said, we're not going to be, uh, we'll try to stick with the agenda. And my part of my job is to help us complete that. So I want to apologize in advance if I defer something to later on. I know there's a lot of interest in the May 6th issue, the release that took place. We'll take a few information and clarification questions, and then we'll continue that when the, the Navy does its technical uh, briefing and updates to us. So uh, just a reminder, we're rules of, you know, we're trying to be civil and work with each other. I know we're dealing with tough issues and with passionate issues uh, and in very important issues. So uh, I just urge you to be, to mind your civility because uh, it, it takes us off track. Now, just one more thing. Uh, we received a number of comments ahead of time. And I'll just tell you who they were from. Uh, from Ernie Lau, from Melanie Lau, and my assumption is you guys are not related. Uh, Denise Boisvert, uh, Andrea Wagner, Helen Nakano, Laura Gray, Paul Bernstein, Kim Jorgensen, uh, and Mileto Aduja, Aduja, my pardon me, and Ann uh, Burdick. So we've received some comments and testimonies. Those are all going to be compiled into the record. Uh, having looked at them, I will just tell you that many of them are a continuing re reiteration of concerns raised in previous meetings, uh, and they will all be part of the compiled record, and you are free to continue to submit comments after this meeting as well. We'll try to end on time today. So I think I've covered it, and uh, with that, uh, I'd like to just uh, dive right in and talk uh, about the uh, May 6, 2021 release then I will turn to uh, Captain Gordon Meyer and uh, Admiral Rob Chadwick. All right, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, thank you. All right, great. Well, aloha to everyone. And for those who I have not met, uh, I'm Rebel Rob Chadwick. And I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak briefly today uh, about our Navy's work here and what really is, I think, one of the more strategic locations in the Pacific. And I think it's important to highlight that in addition to protecting our nation, uh, you know, our work really does also help to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific region. Now, as uh, the commander of Navy Region Hawaii, I'm committed to safe operations and protecting all that we hold so important, our environment, our community, our nation, and our water. I take this responsibility very seriously, as well as another vital aspect of our work, which is ensuring that uh, all the ships and aircraft uh, that are stationed in Hawaii are ready to deploy when necessary. And if you look at the uh, headlines over the last couple of weeks, I think it certainly renews appreciation for the importance of that readiness. Now, we are responsible for safely operating the Red Hill fuel facility and making sure that all of the systems operate as designed. I can assure you uh, that the recent incident is being fully investigated and we continue to work very closely with the regulators. Uh, as has previously been mentioned, uh, I'm gonna be followed by Captain uh, uh, Gordy Meyer, who is our regional engineer, who's gonna get into further details. And as always, we welcome your uh, input and feedback. Uh, over to you, Gordy. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, again, uh, I am uh, uh, Captain Gordy Meyer, uh, Admiral Chadwick's regional engineer, as well as the commanding officer of uh, Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command Hawaii. Uh, regarding the May 6th event, uh, let me say a few things up front. Uh, an investigation is currently underway. And as with any investigation to determine root cause, speculation on the cause cannot be discussed at this time. We want to investigate the investigation to be thorough and unbiased. What we do know is that the containment system in the lower access tunnel worked exactly as intended to capture the fuel spilled from the pipeline. The Navy is working closely with the Department of Health to confirm our assessment that there is no environmental impact or impact to the groundwater. At the request of the Department of Health, we'll continue environmental and groundwater sampling and testing. This is and was not a tank issue. The Navy has examined the tanks and has not identified any damage to any tanks. Now I'll cover uh, some details uh, of the incident. Again, as discussed, this occurred on the 6th of May, approximately one hour following the completion of transfer of fuel into tank 20. A dresser coupling on the pipeline near tank 20 and a separate dresser coupling on the pipeline near tank 18 separated in the lower access tunnel of the Red Hill facility. Red Hill staff immediately identified the separation as soon as it occurred and responded right away. Their response was precisely in keeping with procedures and less than 1,000 gallons of fuel left the pipeline. The spill was captured in the waste sump below the pipeline and fully contained. The lower access tunnel and our containment system were designed to capture release as part of our prevent, detect, and mitigate strategy. To give a visual, uh, the lower access tunnel is essentially a tunnel that is lined on all sides with concrete and has a concrete floor. So the tunnel is completely encased in concrete. The concrete floor slopes to a concrete trench in the floor, which leads to a sump. Any fuel spilled into the floor drains to the trench, trench into the sump and is then automatically pumped to a waste tank downslope. Tank 20 successfully passed tank tightness testing just a few days ago on the 17th of May. This means that tank 20 is secure and there is no fuel being released. This tank tightness testing had been previously scheduled as part of our routine semi-annual testing. Regarding the Dressler coupling separation near tank 18, that tank, tank 18, is completely empty and currently undergoing our clean, inspect, and repair process. To ensure full and frank coordination with the Department of Health, Navy invited the Department of Health to visit the site. And the Department of Health staff did so on the 10th of May. 
As part of our coordination with the Department of Health, we began increased environmental sampling after the event to, to confirm there is no impact to the environment. Environmental sampling and analysis continue today. As expected, the initial results from sampling show no impact to the groundwater. Last Friday, on the 14th of May, NAFAC, or Naval Facilities Engineering Command, awarded a contract to an API certified firm to conduct a third party root cause analysis, perform an integrity assessment, and determine required pipeline repairs. The initial team is on Oahu now, and the investigation is ongoing. Uh, this is the current status, and uh, back to you, Peter. Thank you very much. We'll entertain a few questions, primarily for information and clarification from the committee. This is not the public comment period yet. That will come later on. So the floor is open for committee members. You can raise your hand so I can see you. Uh, Ernie. Uh, thank you for the information, uh, Captain. Uh, the dresser company couple, uh, is used on the pipeline itself. And may I ask uh, what size pipeline was involved in the leak? and uh, what type of fuel leaked out. Okay. Thank you, yes. As previously uh, reported, uh, this uh, was uh, JP5 fuel and the size of the pipe is uh, approximately 18 inches. And if I, just one follow up question, Peter, and I'll- well, Go ahead, Ernie, and then we'll go to uh, Senator Gabbard. Okay. and. Uh, in your uh, lower access tunnel, which contain, and I've been in there multiple times, uh, uh, it doesn't look like the tunnel is completely lined with concrete, or at, at the most, maybe it's gunite on the walls. But uh, uh, how many Dressler couplings are on the pipelines in the lower access tunnel? I, I, from what I saw, there were three fuel pipelines connecting the tanks all the way to Pearl Harbor. How many Dressler couplings are? located in the lower access tunnel on the pipelines? There are multiple uh, dresser couplings and, and the exact number and the details behind that will be uh, part of the investigation was, which is underway. And I do not want to uh, skew or in, interfere with that in ongoing investigation providing uh, additional details that may uh, uh, conflict with that. So we'll learn more later, thank you. Uh, Mike Gabbard. Uh, thank you. Uh, Captain, the news reports indicated that approximately 1,000 gallons of fuel was lost and that 700 gallons was recovered. Is that accurate? And if not, uh, what happened to the other 300 gallons? Thank you. As that, uh, thank you, sir. As that, that investigation is ongoing, uh, we stand by and continue to identify that less than 1,000 gallons uh, were released. Uh, there might be a variety of numbers that, that are thrown out there. Uh, I'm with the ongoing investigation. I do not want to, to speculate where individuals receive different uh, information and numbers, and that will all be part of the detailed investigation underway, sir. Well, Donna has joined the Zoom, so she had to wow. announce every, to everybody that Senator Kim has joined the Zoom. Um, other questions and comments from committee members on for information or clarification? And we will come back to this later. The floor will stay open. We don't have to exhaust this topic but we knew this would be upfront on people's minds. So are there, are there any others from the committee? I can't see everybody, so. Um, okay, if hearing none, the floor. Ernie, did you have another one? Another uh, question? Sorry, last one. Uh, Captain Myers, uh, when will the uh, root cause analysis and the investigation be completed? And what is your timeline and will it be shared publicly? Uh, I do not want to put a, a timeline on the investigation. Uh, obviously, we want to do it uh, thoroughly, uh, unbiased, and, and appropriately. Um, we want to do it quickly, but not uh, uh, not at the expense of thoroughness. And so I do not want to give an exact time frame on that. Uh, okay. Regarding uh, any release, uh, as, as we always do, we will be uh, open and transparent and share uh, any pertinent information with our regulators, including the Department of Health and uh, EPA. Uh, so Joanna, we'll, I think Joanna had her hand up. Oh, All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the department, 
and defend the seriousness of the May 6 event and incident, and we are continuing our investigation and receiving more information from the Navy. We have required the Navy to locate and secure the source of release and submit an assessment of cause and mitigation of the release as to the how, why, and remedy of the leak. As mentioned earlier, the department has also asked all vapor and groundwater samples. The department conducted a site visit on May 10th and will be going out again on May 21st, tomorrow. We are still evaluating the data that has been submitted for this ongoing investigation. Based on total vapor data provided by the Navy thus far, preliminary review indicates that some fuel entered the subsurface as there are elevated soil vapor measurements as compared with measurements prior to May 5th. The department continues to evaluate as more data comes in during this ongoing investigation. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, Don, are you on the committee? Can, can I ask you to hold, please? I want to stick, stick with the committee. Thank you and apology. Uh, Ernie, one last question, I think, for information and clarification, go right ahead, and then we'll move on, and we can loop back to this a little later. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I guess, going back to my fundamental question, will the report be released publicly so everybody can understand uh, what happened and how it will be addressed? Oh, I will say from the Navy's perspective that uh, we will release uh, the investigation and all pertinent information to uh, the Department of Health and uh, EPA and our regulators. And then presumably they would be um, free to disseminate that unless there's something special. Am I right, Captain Meyer? Yes, and so we provide all information to the Department of Health and the regulators. Uh, there are some uh, defense critical information uh, that may be included in that, which uh, may restrict uh, the ability for the regulators to release that, uh, or potential uh, other information that is not of a that is of a classified nature that not, cannot be publicly released. Good, thank you. Let, uh, just to remember that the floor stays open. We can come back to this as we hear further technical updates. Uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, hear from Roxanne Kwan and Steve Linder, uh, kind of a reminder of the function and status of the AOC. So Roxanne and Steve, I'm calling you by first names. Apologies if I'm insulting anybody. We all have first names. You can call me Peter too. All right, I think uh, Roxanne is gonna take the lead on going yes, through the slides. You. Okay, I'll stop first. Um, if you can't hear me, Please let me know so I can speak a little louder. So good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, since our last, com we have a new committee member, so I'll go through the roles and functions of the administrative order of consent, and then I'll follow by with a status report of each of the sections that's in the administrative order of consent. The Navy is considered the, is the owner of the Red Hill Boat Facility. The Navy and the Defense Logistics Sense Agency are the operators of the facility. They are responsible for the design, operation, maintenance, and monitoring of the and release response actions of the facility. The Common Health and ECA are regulatory agencies and we enforce the environmental laws and regulations and we also oversee the implementation of the administrative order consent. Um, Megan, thank you. Next slide. Thank you. The administrative order consent was signed in 2015 in response to the release that occurred in 2014. The order is to ensure that the groundwater resource in the vicinity of the facility is protected and also to ensure that the facility is operated and maintained in an environmentally protected manner. There are several tasks in the AOC, the scope, which is the scope of work. The scope of work is to seek the improvement in the design, operation, maintenance, and monitoring and also, these the scope of work all requirements as in addition to the underground storage tank regulations. The AOC specifies that the, the tanks at the Red Hill facility be upgraded with an approved best available practical technology by September 2037 
And there's also state regulations that require the fuel constructed tanks and airport hydrant system be upgraded to secondary containment or utilize a design which the director determines to be protective of human health and environment. And this deadline is July of 2038. Or if they can't meet these deadlines, they will have to put close the tanks have to be closed. So that was a brief summary of the roles and functions of the AOC and what EPA and our, our department have done. Now for the status of the AOC, there are eight sections. I'm sorry to say that I did not put in section one. <laughs> the section one is project management. It covers the duration of the project, the, um, such as the use of SME, subject matter experts, um, community involvement, and communication and meeting. That's what section one deals with. In section two, um, in terms, it stands for tank improvement, tank inspection, repair, and maintenance. In this program, or in this section, the goal is to identify and evaluate tank inspection, repair, and maintenance procedure, and to develop and implement improvements to these procedures. Um, to date, the work has been essentially completed. However, if there's more information, such as work under the corrosion section, then the program and this section may be modified or revised. Tank 5 has completed the term process, and currently the Navy has four tanks that's undergoing this maintenance pro program. The next section, section 3, is tank upgrade alternative, is to, is to identify and evaluate the various tank upgrade alternatives, and then select the best and implement the best available practical technology and term procedure. Working with section three is section four, which is release detection tightness testing. Section four is to document the current release detection system and tech tightness procedure, and we will evaluate this procedure and implement any improved modification. Back in 2019, September 2019, the Navy has submitted the tech upgrade alternative decision and release decision document to our agency. The EPA and us will review it, and we have issued a notice of deficiency there on, December, on October 2020. Currently, we understand that the Navy is working on addressing our deficiency letter. Section 5 has to do with corrosion and metal fatigue. This section is to evaluate the possibility and extent of corrosion and metal fatigue, as well as practices to control the corrosion and metal fatigue. Based on the evaluation, the procedures in term section two and tech upgrade alternative section three may be modified. Okay, the regulatory agency have received Navy's destructive testing results report data in 2019. The agency, regulatory agency, has issued a letter that we do not concur with the Navy's finding and the additional work needs to be conducted. Um, the Navy has submitted a proposal for additional work, and as far as we have submitted a letter requesting for additional information on this proposal, and we have sent that letter out in May of 10th, 2021. Section 6 and 7 has to do with investigation and remediation of releases and groundwater uh, flow volume. These two sections work hand in hand. Okay. The purpose of Section 6 is to determine the alternative for investigating and remediating release, and section seven, the groundwater protection, is to monitor and characterize the flow of groundwater around the facility. The Navy has submitted two reports to us. They have submitted the investigation and remediation of release report and the groundwater flow model report that's dated March 2020, and we are currently still reviewing these reports. We are still working, we are working with the Navy in scheduling our next groundwater body working group meeting with all my, our subject matter experts. This would include the Department of Natural, Land and Natural Resources, the USDS, and the Board of Water Supply. Okay. The last section, Section 8, Risk and Vulnerability Assessment. Uh, this is, will be assessed the level of risk the facility will pose to the groundwater and drinking water aquifer. This comes in two stages, two phases, some two phases. The first phase, it has to do with associated internal events 
such as structural equipment failure, a Navy has submitted phase one report to us in 2019. We have reviewed the report and we have provided conditioning approved for phase one and also request the scope of work for phase two to four. Phases two to four is with associated with fire, flood, and seismic and other external events. Um, the Navy has submitted this document to us in December of 2020, and we are currently reviewing the scope of work. And that gives you an update of the sections of the AOC. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Roxanne. And uh, let's, once again, a few questions. We're gonna have more time for committee discussion, questions and so on, but if there's a couple of uh, burning questions for information, clarification, let's take those and then we'll move on. Floor is open. Okay, we will come back to that. Steve, did you want to add anything, Steve Linder from EPA? Well, I think Roxanne kind of covered kind of generally the status. Um, you know, I'm really, I think my role here is to just try to help answer questions that come up, you know, in terms of some of the details on, on status. So it looked like Ernie had a question as well. Ernie, go ahead. Really sorry, folks. I apologize. No, no, Ernie, it's quite all right. You no need to apologize. Okay. Uh, well, this is regarding the AOC. Um, does Steve and Roxanne, does the AOC, as written and understood by the parties that are signatory to the AOC, also include investigation consideration of all the infrastructure, uh, not just the tanks itself and maybe a short piece of pipe coming out of the bottom of the tank, but the three miles plus miles from the tanks to Pearl Harbor are all the pipelines also being investigated and covered by the administrative order of consent or is it just the tanks itself? Roxanne, Steve? And I think our position at EPA is that the AOC covers the underground storage tank system and the piping, including the piping in the lower tunnel, is part of that system and you know is uh, subject to regulation. And uh, we believe it is you know, covered under the AOC. The piping has been kind of less of a focus than the tank vessels themselves, but um, and the release, release detection related to the tanks, but the piping is also, you know, very critical uh, part of the infrastructure. And I think that, you know, the first phase of risk assessment also identified that, you know, it, any kind of larger scale release from the facility would, would likely uh, come from, uh, you know, the pipeline is in the lower tunnel. That's probably where the most significant risk exists at the facility and um, the risk of any kind of catastrophic sudden problem from the tank vessels themselves are, are, are quite a bit lower just because of the way they're constructed. The, the encasement in that thick concrete. Thank you. Are there any other questions, quick questions for clarification information? If not, we will come back. There are questions coming in the chat about some of these issues, and that will, we will come back to those later on when we open up for the public portion of this. Um, so I, with that, I'm going to push us along in the agenda. I apologize. I mean nothing about cutting anybody short. So uh, to Perry, if you don't mind giving us a walkthrough on the carryover issues from our last meeting. Too. Over to you. Um, good morning, my name is Keith Perry. I'm the Public Participation Coordinator for the Underground Storage Section of the um, Department of Health. Um, I just wanted to list um, a few things that were still pending from last year's October meeting, uh, three of which the Navy will address and one of which DOH will address. The three for the Navy will be the Indo Pacific Fuel Study. Uh, there was a question about the results from that and if it could be shared publicly. Um, the other one was a request for more information about the um, API, American Petroleum Institute, tank inspection reports that were completed and also um, which tanks um, had gone through that um, clean inspect and repair process. And lastly, it was a um, G -N, uh, TTNA double wall feasibility 
produced last year um, during the meeting, and the public and the members wanted more information about the contract and the status of it um, today. The last one was for, um, Roxanne will answer later, um, it's for the um, Department of Health Compliance Inspection, which was conducted um, last September 2020. We wanted to know the results of that as well. Um, that's all I have. I'll hand it back to either Peter or Peter, and then you can introduce Captain Gordy again. I will. As you can see, many of these agenda oh. items overlap and interweave. So we are trying to organize the agenda in a logical way, but we know that there's many interrelated items on this agenda. So that's why we will leave time later on for the committee discussion and then public comment and public discussion. So let me go ahead and we can come back to this and I'll turn it back over to Admiral Chadwick and Captain Meyer, if you don't want, uh, don't, don't mind and walk us through technical updates, what has been completed, uh, what is in motion uh, and what is the uh, planning that's going forward, what, what's going forward ahead. So. Okay, uh, thanks, Peter. And so I will go right into the technical brief. And uh, as I understand it, we'll address those, uh, those items that were discussed uh, uh, later. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, again, uh, I'll provide the technical update um, as required by Hawaii State uh, statute on fuel constructed underground fuel storage tanks at the Hickam Fuel Annexes, uh, Kuahua Peninsula uh, Pacific Missile Range Facility and the, Red, and the Red Hill Bulk Fuel Storage Facility as previously has been discussed. Again, uh, you heard uh, as the committee agreed to several years ago, the school fuel barracks, military reservation, underground storage tanks are no longer included in this brief. And we actually really look forward to this discussion, which underscores the close work with our regulators, as well as key stakeholders to identify the best solutions moving forward. And so uh, Peter, I think uh, if, if uh, we have my presentation, if we could put that up, uh, please. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. And we can go right to uh, slide two then. Okay, great. And so uh, again, uh, today we'll cover three categories of tanks uh, as we brief the committee today, including the following. Uh, those tanks that are permanently out of use, uh, those that are temporary out of use, and those tanks that are currently in use. Again, uh, Red Hill has 18 operational tanks currently in use or going through the clean inspect and repair process. The other two tanks at Red Hill, tank one and tank 19 are temporary out of use. If you move to slide three, please. The two sites associated with the Hickam fuel annex are permanently out of use. There are no new updates since the last FTAC meeting and the Kapapa remediation and monitoring uh, continues under the guidance of regulators and the site poses no unacceptable public health risks. Um, slide four, please. Uh, Kuahua Peninsula is temporary out of use and pending decommission. Work is in progress currently to secure the tanks and will complete this fall. We currently do not have a timeline for development of, of any development in the area. Slide five, please. Since the last FTAC at PMRF, four of the nine tanks have been removed from service. And each of these tanks are roughly 51,000 gallons. Uh, the four storage tanks were removed from service uh, due to a lower inventory requirements uh, currently. And the five tanks that remain in service were all inspected last year in 2020 and are currently in compliance with APA 65, the impressed current cathodic protection system. All tanks are equipped with visual and audio alarms for spill detection and prevention. We move to slide six, please. And as requested by the Department of Health, uh, the next series of slides in Red Hill are structured uh, as follows. Uh, those items that have been completed since the last FTAC are ongoing actions currently, and then targeted items for completion before the next FTAC. So with that, I'll move to slide seven and jump right into what we have completed. And as you can see here, we have a lengthy list of items uh, accomplished since the last uh, FTAC meeting in October of 2020. 
All tanks in service continue to pass annual tank tightness, semi-annual tank tightness testing, uh, which was just completed again this week, uh, which ended just a few days ago. And all tanks, again, uh, passed tank tightness testing. I I'm sure many of the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sure many of the committee members uh, recall the frequency of the tank tightness testing increased to annually in 2015 and has, uh, uh, and has passed every single year. Uh, since that uh, increase in uh, tank tightness testing from once a year, uh, from every other year to once a year, the Navy has subsequently in 2019 agreed to do semi-annual tank tightness testing, again, uh, more frequent than the requirements allow. Uh, require, I should say. The Metal Fatigue Practices Execution Plan was submitted to the regulators in November of 2020. As you heard earlier, the Risk Vulnerability Assessment Phase 2 Statement of Work was submitted to the regulators in December of 2020. The Navy continues to pursue, pursue the installation of, of additional monitoring wells to better understand groundwater flow in the region of Red Hill. Three additional monitoring wells were completed since the last FTAC, increasing the number of wells to 19. We have submitted our continuous soil vapor monitoring pilot plan to the regulators, and we will begin installation in the coming months with an anticipated start prior to the next FTAC. We continue to conduct technical working group meetings as part of our efforts to better collaborate on multiple initiatives, including our continuous soil vapor monitoring pilot study and our groundwater flow and velocity test through a series of multiple technical working groups uh, that have been meeting since the last FTAC. These technical working groups are not required by the AOC, but were initiated, initiated by the Navy to better facilitate input from the regulators. We move to slide eight. I'll now transition to our ongoing AOC actions. Again, tank tightness testing uh, was in progress from April until just this past week, just this week, uh, and 14 in-service tanks, again, all passed annual tank tightness testing. We are finalizing the procurement process for obtaining new continuous release detection equipment to permanently install tank tightness equipment. As previously discussed, we are in the planning phase of real-time soil vapor monitoring pilot program and will plan to begin installation this summer, which will allow us to monitor under the tanks for real-time indications of any possible release. We are continuing to expand our groundwater monitoring network with the installation of well number 12A currently underway. Navy is working in collaboration with EPA and the Department of Health to design in well tests to better understand how groundwater flows under the Red Hill facility. The tank upgrade alternative supplement providing amplifying information to the regulators is nearly complete and planned to be submitted next month. Navy continues moving forward in our effort to obtain a viable secondary containment solution. Again, we are still in the feasibility stage with the findings and a report due out later this year and I'll provide additional details on the following slides on this effort. Our partnership with the University of Hawaii continues utilizing Hawaii's best and brightest. The Office of Naval Research has just renewed our partnership with UH and we plan on continuing this partnership going forward. We continue regular environmental monitoring, including our quarterly groundwater monitoring well sampling and monthly soil vapor monitoring at at least two to three locations under each tank. All sampling indicates the water remains safe to drink. If you transition to the next slide, this continues to reinforce our annual water quality reports. Again, as required by the State uh, Department of Health, the Navy released the latest water quality report for Red Hill Shaft in June of last year, with our next report being planned to be released next month. Again, as expected, water quality reports from both the Navy and Board of Water Supply continue to indicate that drinking water is safe. Transition to the next slide, slide 10. Uh, next, we'll focus on uh, our upcoming work. And a significant amount of work is expected to be completed before the committee meets again uh, later this year. Again, pending approvals, Navy plans on installing an additional five monitoring wells by the end of 2021. 
We plan to complete well 12A, which is currently in progress, as well as well 17, 17A, 22, and 22A. This will bring the monitoring wells in operation from 19 to 24. We will, continue, we will conduct the next semi-annual tank tightness testing and continue ongoing environmental sampling as well as initiate to our pilot project to install continuous soil vapor monitoring equipment at three Red Hill tanks. We look forward to the regulator's response on multiple products previously, previously submitted to continue moving forward with the AOC. Next month, we will submit to the regulators the tank upgrade alternative and release detection supplemental document. This supplement will address the questions and information requested by the regulators from last October in our 2019 decision document. Additionally, the Navy will be working with the USGS to coordinate with local agencies on future working groups for feedback and ideas on the Navy's groundwater flow model. Next slide, slide 11, please. The plan for further improvements uh, were laid out in the tank upgrade alternative decision document to employ multiple and extensive layers of protection, several I have already spoken about, to prevent, detect, and lessen the risk. The TUA supplemental document, which will be released to the regulars next month, will add amplifying information for the importance of each of these efforts and how the system of systems work together. The agreement between EPA, DOH, and Navy, and DLA, as outlined in the AOC, is to have all tanks upgraded with an approved BAPT by 2037. Again, BAPT, best available practicable technology. Above and beyond the AOC, Navy has reaffirmed our commitment of secondary containment at Red Hill by 2045. The proposed tank upgrade alternative plan fulfills the requirements of the 2015 administrative order on consent between the Navy, DLA, and EPA, DOH to minimize the risk of future fuel releases and to ensure the Red Hill facility continues to operate in an environmentally protective manner. The tank upgrade alternative decision document supplement, which we will provide next month, provides all requested additional amplifying information from the regulators as requested from their October letter. Uh, next slide, please. Red Hills Groundwater Monitoring Network is part of our detection efforts as outlined in our layers of protection. This slide shows the extensive monitoring network around Red Hill. As discussed, the Navy continues to install new monitoring wells to expand its Red Hill Groundwater Monitoring Network. The network consists, currently consists of Red Hill shaft and 19 monitoring wells today throughout Red Hill and in the South Halava Valley. One new monitoring well is in progress, as we talked about, and pending approval, 10 more wells are planned by 2023, bringing the total monitoring network wells to 30. As I have previously discussed, the Navy regularly tests groundwater in all network monitoring wells and in the Red Hill shaft, and drinking water at the Red Hill shaft has always tested safe for drinking. Slide 13, please. Most important to our layers of protection is prevention. Our current improved clean inspect repair process ensures the long-term integrity of the tanks. Currently, four tanks are undergoing this clean inspect repair process. Tanks 13, 14, 17, and 18. We are currently on schedule to return one of these tanks per year to service in each fiscal year from 2021 through 2024. We will continue to take additional tanks out of service to undergo this clean inspect repair process as each tank is returned to service. Navy has proactively revised this clean inspect repair schedule to focus and prioritize the tanks with the most dated inspection to reduce risk of release. Slide 14, please. Part of the feedback process in the AOC is the regulators requesting additional information for clarity. We have received such requests from the tank upgrade and release decision document 
uh, in October of last year, asking for amplifying information in the 16 areas, as Department of Health had previously discussed. Navy is completing a uh, TUA and release detection supplemental document and is planning to sit, submit that document next month. With any document of substantial size and significance as the TUA and release detection decision document, we would expect to receive RFIs asking for additional information, and we believe our supplemental answers those questions. Uh, next slide 15, please. And I would like to, uh, to provide some additional information on the AOC, and in particular, uh, to the tank upgrade and release, de release detection decision document. The red star, small red star you see, shows where we are in the process with our TUA and release detection supplemental document to be released shortly. The supplemental is recommending today's initial BAP utilizing what is proven and available today. Uh, we believe this is critical to continue to have the tanks inspected and repaired with current standards while research and development efforts are in progress for future improvements. The AOC recognizes that every five years there would be continuous improvements, new technology and new information from several of our programs. And that is why the TUA decision document has to be updated every five years. All current research and development efforts, for example, our secondary containment initiative, along with other projects will be included in the next TUA decision document five years from when our initial submission is approved. When tanks are due for their clean inspection and repair, they will be upgraded to the most recent approved BAP with the most advanced technology available. Even after all the tanks have been upgraded with an approved BAP, the tanks will continue to be further upgraded with the most current BAP at that time when the clean inspect repair process is performed. Additionally, Navy's commitment goes beyond the AOC and has committed in writing that all tanks will be upgraded with secondary containment by 2045. By 2037, we expect we'll be on our fourth TUA decision document and our fourth BAP with continued enhancements from the prior BAP. To achieve what all parties want long term, which we believe is secondary containment, we need to continue with available technology today and incorporate results from current research and development projects in the next BAP. It is not a choice between the current clean inspect repair process and secondary containment. We should all want both. I believe we all want the tanks to be as secure as possible today. And that is what is achieved with the best available practical, practical technology today, which, ours, which is our improved clean inspect and repair process. And we all want secondary containment for the future. Unfortunately, this is not a practicable technology today, but looks promising for future BAPs. With that, we can transition to slide 16, where I'll talk about our uh, GTTNA effort, which has been asked about previously. Now, in the 2019 uh, tank upgrade alternative decision document, the Navy committed to installing secondary containment at Red Hill by 2045 or removing the fuel from the Red Hill underground storage tanks. At that time, the Navy was searching for a way to install secondary containment in Red Hill, but the three secondary containment options in the TUA decision document did not rank out higher across the 18 attributes, which is agreed with all the regulators. In our supplemental document, we plan to, which we plan to submit next month, we further reaffirm this. As discussed at the last FTAC in October, the Navy began working with the Defense Innovation Unit to partner with GAZ Transport and Technogaz North America, or GTTNA, last September to investigate the feasibility of using a product typically used to align ocean-going tankers for storage of liquefied natural gas. GTTNA is the industry leader in secondary containment for LNG for ship tankers, even larger than Red, uh, Red Hill Tank, and used in extremely harsh environments. This effort is being performed under a unique contract-like arrangement called an Other Trans Transaction Authority, or, or OTA. This effort is conducted in multiple stages to allow appropriate movement forward, providing, su providing success, providing there is success at each you know, individual stage. Although stage one is not yet complete, the results of the feasibility study look promising so far. 
Stage two is anticipated to be approximately a two-year effort to ensure due diligence and testing is performed to ensure we have all the right material and the right solutions to provide the necessary second, secondary containment solution at Red Hill. The current preliminary schedule as a secondary containment prototype installed in a single Red Hill storage tank by the fall of 2025. We are currently targeting take one to install this prototype if stages one and two uh, prove successful. The design specifications for this effort are to ensure compliance with the Hawaii administrative regulations. Navy will still seek and, can, and will need approval of the regulator agencies before the Navy will commit to installing this system uh, when design is complete after stage two. Next slide, please. As you may recall, during the last FTAC in October, the Navy announced the University of Hawaii had received a grant for $1.9 million from the Office of Naval Research to pursue 11 different initiatives associated with Red Hill. These are progressing well, and we look forward to sharing additional details as these efforts are closer to completion. Today, we are excited to announce our partnership with the University of Hawaii will be continued beyond the first year of initiatives and funding. The University of Hawaii College of Engineering has received another grant from the Office of Naval Research for $4 million to conduct research on five more initiatives described in the slide. All of these initiatives are associated with better understanding and mitigation of corrosion at Red Hill. Some of these will build on the work UH is currently performing already. And this is a great example of the partnership, collaboration, and teamwork, which is key to our collective successes. Slide 18, please. There are already plans to continue this partnership between the Navy and UH for a third year as well. The Navy has already developed a list of projects and is expecting that UH will receive a third grant next year as well. This grant will fund efforts both at the College of Engineering and the Applied Research Laboratory. Some of these efforts are expected to assist us in reviewing and evaluating the GTTNA secondary containment proposal. We are excited and continue to work alongside the best and brightest minds in Hawaii to further improve Red Hill. Slide 19, please. Again, our commitment is safeguarding the water beneath Red Hill is demonstrated by the continued investment into the facility and the supporting programs that I have briefed today. Since the AOC was signed, the Department of Defense has spent nearly $219 million on Red Hill. Over the next five years, DOD is anticipated to spend nearly a half billion dollars. We remain committed to secondary containment. We continue moving forward with efforts to make that happen. While Navy remains committed to future technology of secondary containment, we must all agree that we need to continue with the approved upgrades to the tanks today with the best practicable technology available today. We should not wait for the future at the expense of upgrades today. We, our continued partnership with the University of Hawaii and the Applied Research Laboratory leverages the talents of Hawaii's best and brightest to ensure the water remains protected. Because of all the efforts, the water remains safe to drink as reported annually in water quality reports from both the Navy and the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. All tanks continue to pass tank tightness testing since they began in 2019 with the last testing completed just this last week. A Red Hill tank has never failed a tank tightness test. The Navy is confident the systems that are in place and those that will be implemented as part of the TUA decision document and our supplemental document are protective of public health. We are not only protecting the citizens of Oahu, we're also protecting our own families most of whom who drink the water at Red Hill every day. And we are not protecting the water just for today, but for the generations to follow us. We are in the final review of uh, projects of the Red Hill, final review of uh, submitting the TUA and release detection supplemental document, which will be sent to the regulators next month. It's also important to point out that the fuel stored at Red Hill is not only essential to US national security, 
It will also be vitally important to the residents of Oahu should a hurricane or other disaster occur on the island. And as you can see in the next slide, uh, Red Hill uh, provides that vital strategic asset to the state of Hawaii. In an emergency, Red Hill can be a supply of fuel to the Daniel K. Inouye International Airport, the Honolulu Harbor, Hawaii Electric Company, and first responder ships and aircraft. It was built up on a hill for two reasons. One was so it would be harder to bomb in a war. And second reason was so that gravity could feed the fuel down to the harbor and the airfields as you see here. So even if the power goes out at Red Hill, the fuel can get to where it is needed, including the HECO power plants so that power can be restored as quickly as possible and to the harbor and airport so that our lifelines to the mainland and elsewhere can be maintained. This slide shows the connection of Red Hill to the commercial fuel pipeline system in Oahu, which you see shown in green on this slide. This provides in an emergency the ability for Red Hill to provide fuel anywhere the commercial distribution system operates. And finally, on the next slide, the tank upgrade decision document that was submitted in September 2019 in the supporting supplement to be released achieves the Navy's commitment to environmental protection, the protection of health, and our national security. Some may argue that we must sacrifice security for health and environmental protection, but we can do all three. We need only adapt that same can-do spirit as the people of Hawaii who built the engineering marvel that is Red Hill, which in turn helped the United States of America secure peace in the Pacific. It is in that same spirit that we are partnering with the best and brightest here in Hawaii to ensure the continued protection of our nation and this state and the beautiful environment and our drinking water. The release in 2014 was the result of human error, not corrosion or degradation of the Red Hill infrastructure. In closing, I'd like to state that the Navy is serious about moving forward on the improvements, projects, and innovation initiatives that I have described, and we remain fully committed to the AOC, the state of Hawaii, to the people of Hawaii, and to the protection of Hawaii's natural resources. Thank you, and back to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Gordy, and we're going to, I just want to note that we're getting questions and comments coming in on the chat line. Uh, we'll pick many of those up in the public part of the discussion. Uh, and we're still with the committee's work. Uh, the slides and the chat will all be part of the record of this meeting. So with that uh, committee, committee questions, and we first have uh, Melanie and then Ernie. Melanie, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Because I'm on my headset. Yes. Okay, great. So I have a couple of questions that kind of intertwine. One is uh, Roxanne Kwan mentioned that the deadline was 2038 on the AOC to empty the tanks. By my math, it's 2037, but it's okay to kind of slide it a year. The Navy's math is 2045, um, which doesn't jive with the AOC's recommendation that the tanks be emptied of the fuels by 22 years after the decision document was signed. That's one question I have is how do you slide it to 2045? Um, if we're using the University of Hawaii and the best and brightest, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful. Can we also have them propose above ground tanks that are um, not above the aquifer anymore that they get moved? That would be a different project. My third question is why are tanks number one and 19 offline? This is for the Navy. Um, and that's where I'll stop for now. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Melanie. Let's take those uh, one by one. And um, I'm going to invite uh, Steve Linder, uh, Gordy, and uh, Rox, either Roxanne or Joanna to comment on the dates. We have several different dates. Uh, Melanie wanted to hear a little more understanding of 2037, 2038, and 2045. What's, what is, give us a, a, a simple background. Let me, let me start by trying to answer that. So. Um, there are kind of three different dates and they relate to three different things. So the AOC, that date that you say, the 2037, that is correct, that as long as a, a, 
what's called a, a, a MILCON appropriation is not necessary. The deadline in the Red Hill AOC is 2037, but there are provisions to provide up to five years of additional time if a MILCON appropriation is necessary to do the work. And so what that is, it's a military construction appropriation. So if, if, if the work they're doing is considered construction of something new and not repair, uh, the Navy would need to go to, uh, to Congress and ask for a appropriation for that additional money. So that 2037 date um, could be extended. Now the 2038 date is the date in the Hawaii regulations, the HAR uh, that requires um, upgrades. And, th and those regulations were promulgated after the AOC was put in place. And then that third date that the Navy mentions, 2045, I mean, we APA look at that as kind of a, a stated goal of the Navy to have the tanks uh, secondary contained or shut down by 2045. At, at this point in time, it's not a you know enforceable requirement. Thank you. Uh, you want to add anything to that, uh, Gordy Meyer or uh, Joanna Seto or Roxanne? Anything to add to these dates? Uh, they, there's three different dates, and they can be kind of confusing. But Steve just gave us one. Anything to add? From, from the Navy side, no, nothing additional to add. I think you explained them well. And uh, you know, 2045 is our commitment uh, to that secondary containment or defuel from Red Hill. Okay. Um, Melanie, restate your second question. I'm sorry that I, I didn't write it down. I, I, I wanna encourage everybody to be very brief. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. I, I, Steve said something about the, what was your last comment about the quarter or corner? I'm not sure how that applies to why you can slide it to 2045. But my second question was actually, can you put, can you use the best and brightest at the UH to try and propose above ground tanks that are double walled and not over the aquifer? Um, since we're spending money and giving them money to do that, why not also give them a project for that? And the, oh, my third one was, why is tank one and 19 off? All right, let's go back. And uh, Gordy, you want to speak to either of those? Sure, I, I will cover uh, some of that, Peter, and allow DOH or EPA to, to add anything further. And so uh, the relocation of uh, the fuel tanks from Red Hill has been studied previously, and the Red Hill fuels, fuel facility remains uh, the best location that is needed for the protection uh, of the strategic fuel reserves uh, for what uh, the Navy and the Department of Defense needs. And so we have some important uh, items for the Department of uh, of uh, naval research uh, to fund with UH. And uh, we believe that the initiatives that they are working on are the most important to support uh, what is needed for the strategic uh, fuel reserves of the Department of Defense. Uh, regarding the second uh, question of why are tanks one and 19 offline, uh, they're offline because current needs within the Department of Defense do not require the use of those tanks. And the capacity and requirements uh, for the Department of Defense can be uh, obtained through the currently uh, current 18 tanks that are active in Red Hill. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, I want to try and Melanie, I, I'm, I want to try and keep them one questions one at a time so we don't get too tangled up. And uh, th thank you. I, I apologize. I should have caught that earlier. So Ernie, over to you. What's your question? Uh, this is regarding, uh, the, the, thank you, uh, Captain Myers, for the uh, presentation. Uh, this goes back to the May 6th uh, leak that occurred about two weeks ago. Uh, can you let us know what information has been provided to DOH regarding the release to date? And what, when do you uh, anticipate submitting more information in the near term? Uh, how did you, and how and when did you inform the Department of Health about the release? Did you submit a confirmed release notification to the Department of Health? Uh, how were the how was DOH informed and when? Yes, um, uh, the Department of Health has been provided all of the information that we do on uh, environmental sampling. We've been open and transparent in our discussions with the Department of Health. As discussed, we've invited uh, the Department of Health uh, to the facility. They have been to the facility uh, and they plan to uh, go to the facility again tomorrow. 
uh, to look at that. And so a uh, notification uh, to, to DOH was made uh, quickly after the event, uh, and we continue to openly provide any uh, reports and information to the Department of Health. Uh, how, uh, just to clarify, Captain, how was the notification provided to DOH after the immediately after the event, and when? Yeah, we uh, provided them uh, rapidly after the, the very quickly after the notification, and uh, all of that, along with uh, the root cause analysis, will be part of our investigation to ensure all proper protocols and information was conveyed appropriately and uh, conduct was done appropriately. Uh, so the, wouldn't you be able to provide to us the uh, copy of the notification, which doesn't include the investigation report? Can you make that public? Yeah, we've provided all that information to the Department of Health and uh, Department of Health, uh, well, obviously working within uh, the constraints of defense critical information, uh, has uh, uh, the ability to uh, take, uh, to release anything that uh, deemed appropriate. Uh, thank you. Then uh, my question to the Department of Health is: Can we? Can the pub? Can you release the uh, notification that the Navy provided to you about the leak publicly? Steve and Joanna, I think that question is to you. DOH. Are you with us on that? Did you hear the question? Oh, yes, I heard the question. Thank you. The Department of Health has not received any written notification at this point. Uh, then a question, Joanna. Um, is it a requirement of a fuel, you know, a fuel storage facility, underground storage facility owner uh, to provide some type of written notification uh, upon learning about a leak or release? For, for suspected releases, it is a bubble notification, and that is sufficient. Uh, so did you folks get a verbal notification then? Yes, they did. How, how quickly after the leak occurred did you get the verbal notification from the Navy? I guess that would be a phone call. We received a phone call at around 7.30 a.m. on Friday morning. Uh, and when do you understand the leak actually occurred? 6.35. Around 6.35 6 p.m. on 30. Thursday evening. That would be uh, May 5th? May 6th. May 6th. May 6th, I think, Ernie. OK. So 6.45 p.m. and then you got a notification the following morning at 7.30 a.m.? Around that time, yes. Uh, does the Department of Health have a 24-hour number that uh, operators of these facilities can call? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Do, you, do you know why the Navy didn't call you earlier, like uh, 12 hours earlier? I do not have that answer, no. And maybe I guess the question back to you, uh, Captain Myers, why did the Navy not notify the Department of Health upon uh, discovery of the leak? Trying to do Peter, this is Disco. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Captain Retired Brian Bennett. I am the sitting member of the FTAC, normally delegate these responsibilities to the region and to uh, the Gordy at NAVFAC. Uh, my caution is we probably need to be careful with this line of questioning, questioning for two reasons. One, because the investigation is ongoing that will determine and promulgate the facts related to this. And the second, and not the least of which, is that this line of questioning now becomes part of the record associated with the reopening of the contested case hearing. The... Um, the presiding individual has asked that May 6 in, uh, information be provided, public information be provided as part of that secondary, as part of that uh, litigation. And Ernie is, as you well know, as a litigant in this, and this, because this becomes part of the record, this is probably best uh, discussed between your legal counsel 
and the Navy Litigation Office in the context of the ongoing litigation. I thought the Navy wrong. wanted to be transparent. Hang on. What, well, happened, what happened to transparency? Hang on, hang on. Who's that speaking? That's well, only me, Peter. Kima, would you hold your comments? We're going to come back to it in the public discussion. I promise you that. Um, what about it, transparency, Peter? The Navy on, keep talking about being Kimo, transparent. Kimo. Now they refuse to answer Ernie's question. No, no, Kimo, that's not what we just heard. So can you please mute yourself? Uh, and Disco, can I ask you, uh, if I understood it right, you're saying that that will be part of the investigation and we, in the report. Ernie's questions will be answered in that investigative report. Is that correct? You're on mute. Thank you. I can't speak to exactly how the investigation will take place. Clearly, it's ongoing right now. And, but the investigation, I can assure you, will be thorough. I know the Department of Health will be conducting their own investigation into this. And I think in dual course, that information will be made available. In the meantime, we do have a real-time requirement to address the presiding officer's uh, questions related to uh, the contested case hearing. And that information will be made available in conjunction with that hearing and uh, the, the legal counsel for both, uh, for both sides, of course, will be addressing those issues specifically. Okay. I suspect we'll be coming back to this. Uh, so we probably haven't heard the last word. So uh, I want to continue to make sure we are getting the committee's comments. And I think, uh, Ryan Imada, are you part of the committee? Yes, I'm representing the Commission on Water Resource Management. Okay, go ahead. You were next up in line if I'm following it right. Okay, yeah, thank you. I have uh, two questions for the Navy. Take, uh, give us one question. at a time. Let's take them one at a time. Sure. Uh, question one, um, does the Navy understand uh, the hydrogeology, specifically um, the direction of groundwater flow? The wells that we've permitted for uh, groundwater monitoring um, seem to look at two different things. They look at uh, groundwater, groundwater, uh, just an understanding of the different layers of groundwater, um, and also for leak detection. So can the Navy comment on the intent of the wells with, with respect to geologic investigation versus leak detection? Gordy, over to you. Sure. Obviously, we, we want to look at both. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, proper monitoring takes place at the Red Hill facility. Uh, with the added benefit that it will help us better understand uh, the groundwater flow that is under Red Hill. And so obviously uh, both of those efforts uh, are looked at when we determine uh, where uh, we conduct our uh, groundwater monitoring wells. Okay, thank you. My, then my uh, follow-up question, uh, yeah, my follow-up question is, um, does the Navy have a plan or does the Navy have enough of an understanding of groundwater flow to have a plan to, um, to do remediation in case there's a big spill? Because presumably I would imagine that they would, or, or you guys would drill a well, uh, pump it out, treat the, treat the water and then dump it back in, right? Um, so is there, I guess, is there a plan for remediation if there's a big spill? Yes, that is aligned, uh, will be aligned in our supplemental release uh, uh, detection document, as well as our tank upgrade, as well as the other reports that we have submitted with the groundwater uh, flow modeling reports and other things that we have done. And so, yes, uh, that will be a consideration. And, uh, you know, those are within our documents on how we uh, conduct that uh, process. Okay, so at a certain point, do you imagine that, um, you know, drilling a well and having the treatment facility is going to be a going to be kind of a long process to construct and to get in place. Um, is there is it the intent to kind of get ahead of the curve, to you know as we as we start to understand groundwater flow to maybe strategically put wells in, to um, to do that remediation. But I mean it, it's it's kind of a you don't really know where you're going to have releases or, or or if there are releases where they're going to be but um at the same time i see it as a as a difficult thing because we're doing the permitting and we can't give a permit for a well 
uh, tomorrow, right? We have to um, subject it to review and, and understand that it um, doesn't pose any risks in and of itself. Um, is, is there a plan, I guess, to uh, to sort of get ahead ahead of the curve in that respect? So yes, we obviously want to, to protect uh, the, the water and uh, part of our mitigation strategy is to ensure uh, that we do that appropriately. Um, as you know, there is a lot of uh, discussion uh, on the groundwater flow and uh, different opinions. Uh, Navy's uh, you know, uh, studies and efforts have shown uh, that uh, there can be mitigation. And when we get uh, obtain agreement on what that is and we all work together on uh, a plan to support that, uh, Navy is, is ready to, to move forward. Okay, I'm gonna move on. And Steve, are you, Steve Lee, are you speaking as a member of the committee? Steve, Steve Lee. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna make a comment. No, are I'm, you a member of the committee though? I'm just checking because I don't have the list in front of me. Are you a member of the committee? I'm not sure what the committee uh, is. Why don't you hold, hold off sure. and we'll open it back up in the public comment. So uh, I think uh, um, unless, um, yeah, Mike Gabbard, go ahead. And then Melanie. One question yeah, uh, at a time, folks. The uh, GTTNA, the pilot project, has that been approved by the EPA and DOH? Uh, hey, this is uh, Captain Meyer, sir. And so uh, that has not yet been approved by uh, EPA or DOH. Again, we are in the early uh, research and development and feasibility stages. And so once we get past that, we are, are ready and uh, very interested in sharing that to make sure we are all in agreement that that is the right way forward. And question for DOH. Uh, the DOH, they issued a letter stating that the Navy could continue to operate until the contested case is resolved. Any idea when they're going to, DOH is going to make the ruling on the Navy's permit application? Well, that's really a question over to Joanne. Joanna. Uh, it's an ongoing situation and we are waiting for more information. The hearing officer is continuing to work on that contested case. Thank you. Melanie. Hi, thank you. Um, my question relates back to uh, Captain Meyer. You mentioned that feasibility studies were done earlier um, and you kind of nixed the idea that relocating the tanks was not a good idea for security, money purposes, et cetera. But if we're going to go with your Venn diagram that there is actually a sweet spot between public health and Navy's uh, security. It seems like you, it was unilaterally decided that security trumps public health in that sense. So who decided that it was not a feasible um, option and why not let the UH try and any other private contractor, contractor bid on a project of that scope? Thank you. And so uh, re regarding uh, the, the study, you know, we, I guess 2018 study was conducted that, that reviewed that and looked at that and uh, not feasible uh, from the perspective of, uh, of national strategy and uh, strategic importance of, of that fuel and how it, it and where it is stored. And so that was a key factor. And when we go to the Venn diagram, I will say that uh, I, I'm not sure uh, I would agree that uh, the relocation of Red Hill has to occur to meet uh, that sweet spot in the center of that Venn diagram. I believe we can all work together to find that uh, protection of, of environment, human health, and national defense within Red Hill uh, with uh, the appropriate technology and resources put forward to make that happen. Okay. Why is it, why is Point Loma and San Diego able to do it, but we cannot? I mean, other than you're gonna tell me that the amount of fuel here is a lot, I get it but best available practicable technology is not best available practical technology, which everybody keeps sort of interchangeably using. We do have practicable technology, which is the above ground double wall tanks, which are used at these other stations. So again, um, the Venn diagram still skews towards security and not public health. 
Uh, Captain Meyer, do you want to respond or? Sure. I will just say that uh, I don't think we can compare Red Hill uh, to other facilities. It's a, a very unique, different uh, uh, facility with different requirements. Uh, that is why we continue to operate uh, Red Hill as it is today. Okay, uh, what I would like to do is uh, we're at uh, pushing towards our uh, the time when I want to open it up and let the public talk and have their questions answered and their comments registered. So before we do that, though, I want to see if there's any further comments or questions from the committee members. So committee members, you're still on. Peter, I think that Steve Lee is a member of the FCAC. I'm sorry, uh, I can't tell who's talking here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Steve, did you? Yeah, Steve, thank you for the clarification. So the floor is open for committee comments or questions. And otherwise, we're going to move on and let the public open up. There are lots of questions coming in. And uh, I want to honor those. We need to hear from the public on this. They will have questions and comments as well. Anything else from the committee? Okay, if, if not, thank you. And committee members, you will be welcome to add further, but I want to let the public speak first. Oh, wait. Thanks. Hold on, Peter. There's anything from members. I'm sorry, I can't. It's very hard to hear you with your mask on. I know you need to mask up, but. Peter? Yes. Ernie Lau, hand up. As okay, well as Melanie. Ernie. Ernie and then Melanie. Go okay. ahead, Ernie, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, question for Joanna. I, I think I heard uh, that the, uh, was it the soil vapor data uh, indicated elevated levels after the leak? Uh, uh, is the soil vapor monitors uh, outside the containment system of the lower, the Navy, what the Navy says is the containment system of the lower access tunnel? That was good. You're directing that to Joanna's? Uh, yeah, to the Department of Health. Uh, Roxanne or anybody from the yep. Department of Health can answer that. The probes themselves are located outside of the tank. Okay. And it's uh, located underground below the lower access tunnel. So it monitors uh, fuel releases that might have seeped from the lower access tunnel into the environment uh, where the, the monitor well is located. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, also, could you provide that data to the to the public? As to the time, you're asking about where the, lo the location of those vapor monitoring systems are? Uh, right, and the data that uh, shows the uh, elevated levels that they did to, to the, uh, after the leak occurred. Okay. The the data is a part of the ongoing investigation, so I'm not I'm not able to release it at this time. Uh, we will release it once the investigation has been completed. So it's part of the investigation report that we we don't yet know when that's coming, but it will be part of that. Is what it sounds like, Melanie. Mahalo. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Ernie. Hi. Uh, sorry. Can Can you have Steve Linder explain to me again the twenty forty five slide date again? I'm not quite sure how that works again. Thank you. Yeah. So the that twenty forty five date is a date that the Navy has expressed in, in in public meetings, and they did it again today, where they basically, um, you know, their goal uh, is to have the tanks either secondary contained or shut down by twenty forty five. And like I said earlier, um, you know, that is the Navy's goal. They call it their commitment, but it is not at this point in our eyes as the regulatory agencies, an enforceable date. Melanie, does that give you the answer? Does that explain what he's what he meant by 2045? I, I guess I would need something more practical. So if the tanks are all of them are not double lines, you know, secure, et cetera, does that mean you empty whatever is not done? Um, I guess I'm imagining that GGTNA might get one or two tanks done. So what do you do with the other 16? Right, so uh, let me explain. So under the AOC, the AOC requires the Navy to upgrade all tanks to approve what we call BAP, Best Available Practical Technology, as kind of approved by the regulatory agencies 
by 2037, you know, unless additional time is granted because of the uh, appropriation needs. And so any tank that does not meet that deadline would under the AOC uh, would need to be basically taken out of service. So would no longer be allowed to um, store fuel. Um, and so it would have to be empty. Um, under the state's regulations, the state's regulations require secondary containment or um, an alternative deemed protective by the uh, director of health by uh, 2038. So under the state regulations, all the tanks would need to essentially meet the re state's regulatory requirement or be taken out of service, meaning no longer store fuel by 2038. And what the Navy is saying is they're committed to either having the tanks secondary contained or shut down, meaning no longer containing fuel by 2045. So these, these, those three different, uh, you know, the, the AOC, the state regs, and the Navy, you know, goals slash their stated commitment, they're not aligned right now. It's something that, um, you know, we may be able to resolve in the, in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, committee. I want to open it up. And I um, see in the chat, I haven't read the chat very carefully. It's very hard to watch you guys and what read the chat. But I, there's a long string of questions from Kimo Frankel. So Kimo, why don't you ask your first question, get it answered, then we go to the second question. But I also want to make sure other members of the public have time to speak. So Kimo, you're on. It's a, it's a simple yes or no question. Uh, was the pipe cu coupling leak a leak from the nozzles or from the pipe, or does it have nothing to do with the nozzles? You're speaking of the May 6th release. Correct. And I'm, when I talk about the novels, I'm talking about the nozzles identified in the quantitative risk and vulnerability assessment phase one study. Captain Gordy. question for the Navy. Yeah, Captain Gordy, over to you. Yes, as I discussed, the release occurred at a dresser, dressler, dressing coupling near tanks 18 and tank 20. Uh, an investigation is underway. And uh, as with any investigation, uh, to determine root cause, I do not want to speculate or provide uh, additional information to biased investigation. A, is it related to the nozzles or not? Or do you not know? You can say, I don't know. It's under investigation. Okay, second question. Did any of the fuel flow near or above the many metal lids on the floor of the tunnel, some of which are lids to wells, yes or no? Again, you can say, I don't know. So yes or no, or I don't know. Or I'm, I'm, we're the invest investigation is underway. Do you know? An investigation is underway. So um, this, is for, this is for DOH. Um, uh, you guys have been posting data regarding the uh, soil vapor measurements. Um, Reg fairly regularly, when can you post the data that you have now about the soil vapor measurements that have occurred since May 6th? Can you post them uh, by the end of this week? No, because this is an ongoing investigation and we are not able to give you that information at this time. Actually, that's not true. The law does not prohibit you from releasing that information. You guys regularly post that information. The law does not forbid you simply because you're doing an investigation from posting data you regularly post. Um, that is not being transparent um, if you're going to change your practices. Okay, the question has been asked and they've said, they've answered you. You may not agree with the answer, but they've answered it as they can. They've said it's part of the investigation. So I understand your point. You take your point. It's part of this record. Uh, can I see if there are other questions that, why don't you take one more on your list, Kimo, and then we'll open up and see if others have qu questions or comments. I mean, it seems ridiculous and you know it, Peter, when every answer is gonna be, we're investigating, we can't tell you anything. Can you tell me how was the May leak detected Navy? Was it a visual detection or did your software alert you to the release of fuel? It seems pretty obvious. You could say one or the other. This is Captain Meyer. I'll say it was, yeah, it was detected ahead. immediately. 
and uh, further details are part of the investigation. Say that again. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one more time? I didn't hear that. Sure. The release was detected immediately, and further details will be part of the investigation. So the question of how the how it was released will come later when your investigation is done. Yes, and we'll just that as part of the overall investigation. Just so I'm clear, the, the the trajectory of your investigation is it goes to the regulators first, and then they can make it public. Am, am I right about that? Yes. We will complete the investigation uh, to determine uh, root cause, and we will share that with the regulators. And so far, you have no uh, timing on that. It's not clear when that will happen. No, we don't have timing. We obviously want to move quickly on the investigation, but we make sure it's done thorough and appropriately. All right. Can I, uh, Kimo, I know you have other questions, and we'll come back to those. I want to see if there are other members of the public that have questions or comments they want to make. There are a number of things already registered in the uh, chat system. Others? You're going to have to speak because I can't see everybody. So, all right, hearing none, Kimo. Uh, uh, I, I let somebody else go. I've okay. dominated too much. Fine. I, I, um, I just, like some, Ash has I, a question. Ask yeah, um, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Um, well, first of all, hello, my name is Ashley Nishihara and I'm part of the group Protect Our Aquifer. Uh, the Navy says that the fuel stored at the Red Hill facility is critical to national security and the people of Hawaii in the event of a disaster. But I say what is even it is actually critical, not only on an everyday basis, but especially during an emergency is safe water to drink, cook, bathe, wash our hands, cleanse our wounds, our dishes, our laundry, get the tanks out right now, relocate them above ground away from our drinking water, don't leave them there and try to stall for time, and promise to start taking action years from now with the secondary, secondary containment schedule. Don't try to patch up the tanks and fix them, because that'll likely end in another large spill, like the 27,000 gallons that leaked in 2014, or a potentially catastrophic spill that dwarfs even that. And don't waste any more time and money by installing new monitoring wells because they are useless in preventing the problem from happening in the first place. Get them out now. That's all. Thank That's you all for your comment, Ashley. I know that there's a lot of debate that could take place on this, but today we're capturing the comments. Thank you. Are there other members of the public? I'm gonna, otherwise I'm gonna go back to our, some of our committee members who have their hands up. Yes, Ann Wright. Go ahead, Ann. Yeah, um, I'm uh, Ann Wright. I'm a retired U.S. Army Colonel. I'm also a former U.S. diplomat. I'm a member of uh, Hawaii Peace and Justice. And I just wanted to emphasize, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Liu mentioned, that you know there, there are other ways that have been used by the Department of Defense, of which I was a part of for 29 years, <laughs> uh, to uh, resolve these issues of underground tanks and both Point Loma and, uh, and one up in uh, the state of Washington uh, have already received uh, above ground tanks and the national security issues were exactly the same as they are here in, in uh, Hawaii. And uh, I just would really encourage us, uh, the state of Hawaii uh, to encourage the Biden administration to use some of this uh, infrastructure money that's going to be coming down uh, to uh, put uh, Red Hill on the agenda uh, for infrastructure money for us in Hawaii to get rid of the Red Hill tanks that are definitely a danger to our water supply. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. And if you will notice, we have a little countdown timer running on the left side when you have a comment and it can be longer. We're trying to keep in within three minutes. Thank you. So we can accommodate as many as possible. Thank you again, Ann and Ash. Others? Ernie and Melanie, I'm going to go back to you. What? Hi, um, sorry, this is Asami with Senator Kim's office. Please, please go ahead. Um, she had a question. I, I just want to get it answered. Um, and her question was, how many gallons of fuel was released before it was detected? We were told by the Navy that they had installed safeguards to detect any leaks to prevent future release of fuels. Uh, that question is also in the chat. So, um, Gordy, how many? How much release? Best best estimate of the amount. 
<clears throat> so when the event occurred, which was a sudden event, uh, the release was stopped immediately. Uh, proper protocols were followed and all fuel was captured as it uh, should have been appropriately within the systems that they are designed to do. The, the, <laughs> and, and, and as, oh, as we know. have stated previously, <laughs> people, would you mute yourself, please? This is really, it's really interrupting the rest of the conversation. Why so, did I ask him to mute himself? He doesn't give us any you, answers. Kimo, would you please do that? Please give us a little help here. So, um, and as the, we stated previously, less than 1,000 gallons were released. The, the media reported 1,000 gallons. Do you have a better number? At this time, uh, we are reporting less than 1,000 gallons as part of the investigation. Uh, there'll be more details uh, on the exact numbers and uh, additional information uh, that is part of the investigation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ernie, back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, Captain Myers, uh, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with coupling leaks or pipeline leaks. We have main breaks almost every day in our water system. Uh, from the time that you notice or your operator noticed there was a leak or release how how quickly were you able to shut the valves in that 18 inch uh, jp5 pipeline uh, to actually secure and stop the leak how quickly did that occur from time of notice uh, to uh, shut down of the leak as I stated, this was a sudden event and our operators uh, reacted quickly and appropriately uh, per their procedures and exact time, uh, whether you're talking milliseconds or, or minutes, uh, will be part of the investigation that is ongoing. Are, are the valves in, the, in that pipeline, are they controlled remotely by your operator at uh, the attic number one? Yes, all of that, including uh, the details uh, of the system, will be part of the investigation. Okay, right. well, thank you, Ma Captain Myers. I look uh, forward with great anticipation to the investigation report being released by the Department of Health. You can see, uh, Captain Myers, that there's a lot of concern about this, about the details of what happened and when it happened and what uh, occurred. And so uh, lots of encouragement for the Navy to move forward as rapidly and as expeditiously as possible. Other questions? Other comments? Floor is still open. Thank you. The department is continuing its investigation. Data is coming in very quickly. However, we want to make sure that the uh, evaluation is done correctly and appropriately once that is done and we are we are satisfied with information we will be releasing that to the public thank you joanna so the floor remains open here i don't want to end the meeting prematurely if you have a comment or a question please. yes hi Yes, go ahead. This is Jesse Fagg. I'm with Senator Carl Rhodes' office. I just wanted to follow up on a question from Ernie Lau. He put in one of the chat comments that the Board of Water Supply has not been included in AOC meetings for nearly two years. And I wanted to know if there was a reason for that. Um, and if the Board of Water Supply wanted to be included in those meetings, would they be able to in the future? That's a question. I'm going to go back to Steve and to Joanna on that because it's an AOC function. All right, so the, um, I can give you a little insight into kind of uh, the dynamic there. So the yeah, the Board of Water Supply, you know, early on um, was included in uh, most uh, of the meetings, but we started getting into some areas where the Navy felt like certain material has a certain degree of confidentiality. Uh, they requested the Board of Water Supply to sign a non-disclosure agreement which Board of Water Supply uh, did, you know, was not willing to sign. So that was kind of one of the barriers that uh, kind of limited their participation. And along with that, um, at least from my observation, what I saw was um, that a lot of the public outreach done by the Board of Water Supply after meetings that they participated in, participated in um, was, uh, you know, basically, uh, 
a concern for the Navy. So the Navy, you know, felt like um, that, you know, transparency with Board of Water Supply was not in their best interest. So that, that was my takeaway as, as to why kind of things have evolved to where they are now, where the Board of Water Supply is, um, you know, not involved in all of the kind of detailed kind of deliberative discussions on AOC work. In other words, some of it is confidential. Some is confidential and, and some of it is deliberative and it's not final decisions yet. It's being reported on, you know, publicly and that's the Navy didn't want that to happen. Ernie, you want to clarify BWS position on this? Uh, yeah, you know, our reason for not signing the non-disclosure agreement was that this is an important issue that we did not want. We wanted to be able to communicate publicly uh, to our customers and to our board uh, because the board would not, we would not sign the uh, NDA. Uh, also, the information that we share, and we actually didn't really, uh, Steve portrays it like we actively attended an AOC meeting, then we went out on a public information campaign sharing everything that was discussed in the AOC uh, meetings. Uh, that is untrue. Uh, what we did was we followed up each AOC meeting with a very detailed written comments to the regulators, to the Department of Health, expressing our concerns and our recommendations on what was discussed at the ALC meetings. And what was discussed at the ALC meetings, there was nothing confidential discussed there. If it was confidential because we did not sign the NDA, then the documents would be redacted. You can see that on the documents posted by the EPA and Department of Health on their websites, heavy re redactions, blacked out areas. So that's the information that basically we made our comments based on all redacted information and no confidential information. So just want to go on the record for a clarification of that, uh, what I consider misrepresentation by Steve. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, I want to take other comments. Uh, I'm not sure whose hand this is. Lana? Joanna. Joanna. Go ahead. Thank you. So does, does Board of Water Supply is part of the groundwater groundwater modeling working group and that working group has not had a meeting recently uh, they are working to schedule one sometime this calendar year uh, hopefully soon, sooner than that uh, so just to let you know Ernie we will be contacting you uh, yeah thank you John I appreciate that the last meeting was canceled and I guess it's going to be rescheduled uh, but the uh, other meetings on the other sections of the ALC, like the term, the TUA, uh, those meetings, you know, we're, we're no longer invited to those discussions. And, and I feel, I, I thank you, uh, whoever brought that up, uh, my comment in the chat. Uh, this issue of the administrative order and consent, the only public representation representing the people that we serve on Oahu is the Board of Water Supply. And we take that uh, responsibility very seriously uh, to be able to uh, represent the interests and viewpoints of our customers, the people that we serve on the island of Oahu. Mahalo. Thank you, Ernie. Um, I want to go over to Lana. Is it Lana? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just been participating for a few years, and I, I just want to. Nobody has acknowledged the fact that the Navy. Has, has responded to the public's requests. And I, and I really, you know, no matter what your, your thoughts are about this situation, I, I really appreciate the Navy responding to the public's request for having semi-annual updates. Um, I, I think it gave you an opportunity to go into a little more detail about what was going on. Um, and I just wanna ask two questions. When you have these different working group meetings and you go through and present um, the well logs and the different monitoring information. Is that information that's available to, to the public or does that just stay contained within documents to, to the regulators and then it's up to them to, to share? So let's take that question first and then we'll come back for your other question. And that's an open question to the, both the Navy and the regulators, I think. Yes, it is. Yes, this is Captain Meyer. And so uh, all information that we, we submit to the regulators, <clears throat> both EPA and DOH, uh, per uh, administrative order on consent and any uh, statutes and regulations that require. 
So, so then um, I've also heard that you are passing this, in, that the information is going to the regulators and that because I've also heard several statements that um, some of this information hasn't been able to be released from by the regulators because it contains information that's sensitive to the DOD. So I'm wondering if there are staff members at the DOH that have the training required to be able to remove or like black line the, uh, the text, diagrams, maps, whatever it is in these documents that's provided to the regulators that would be helpful to the public to get, you know, a more detailed understanding. I have a background in this kind of information and, you know, I, I, um, I, I'd like to be an informed member of the public, you know, and so I'm just wondering, you know, whether the staff is available for the DOH to be able to release these documents or whether they, they get the documents from the military or the DOD. I know I have a few more minutes and the DOD says, well, I'm sorry, you can't release them. And the DOH says, well, we have nobody on staff that can edit these so we can't release them either so i'm, I'm just curious about that kind of dynamic thank okay, you very much we, yeah thanks why don't we go over to doh then uh, it's, i think it's a question of do you have the resources to do what uh, folks are saying is required or needed the, the department of health received redacted documents the department of health received redacted documents and those are the documents that are posted on our website so okay, some of those great. are redacted. Okay, great. So so what I'm hearing from you is that is that am I hearing from you that hundred percent of the information that you get from the um, from different from the Navy and different parts of the DOD is provided to the public in a redacted form? Is that what I just heard? Is that correct, Joanna? <laughs> Department of Health, the Department of Health received both redacted and unredacted documents. We are only allowed to post the redacted version. Got it. And do you have somebody on staff that like goes through and, and looks at the difference between what the information is and like whether there's, you know, I mean, I'm assuming that that's part of your comment process where you go through and you go, oh, wow, you guys redacted this, but we think it should be included. I'm, I mean, I'm just curious whether those docu whether those kind of discussions happen or whether you just kind of accept it at face value. You know, here's the redacted and here's the unredacted. There is a general review of the unredacted documents to compare it with the redacted version. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you once again for having these meetings more regularly and for upgrading the, the monitoring and the inspection more regularly. Um, I, I, I appreciate those, those efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lana. Uh, David. Uh, is Dave, Dave Mullinex? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I, I think that uh, it's very insulting that uh, first I would thank Melanie Lau and, uh, and Ernie Lau for, for their ongoing um, protection of our community. We can trust them implicitly. And I think it's insulting to um, Ernie Lau and to us all to have him cut out of these meetings. Uh, we all trust him. And by the military and, and whatever, cutting him out of the meetings, it's cutting us all out. And it's like you say, if you don't trust him, you don't trust any of us. The military has lied consistently all over the country. They have toxic sites all over the country. Water has been contaminated. They never bothered to tell the community. They never warned the community about this. So we know that the military lies. And we know we cannot always trust them, but we know we can trust Ernie Lau. And so uh, I, I, from the public point of view, we encourage and uh, really demand that he be, and he's very trustworthy and he know he's an honest man and, and, uh, and he's part of our community. So um, I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks for your comment. I saw Ernie feeling good about that when he heard that. Yes, Melody, go ahead. You're on mute. No, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I have a question or several questions, I guess. Take them one at a time, please, so we okay. don't get everything compounded together. Okay, I, I wanted to, I guess, regarding what Anne writes, uh, Ann Wright's comment about uh, Port Loma and then the other naval base would be Navy base Kitsap Manchester in Washington state. Now in that case, they also had World War II 
uh, underground storage tanks. They had eight of them and they were replaced with six above ground tanks, state of the art. So it, given that we're just, you know, these tanks, our tanks are on the aquifer and here we are in Washington and probably not have that type of uh, danger as we do, why couldn't uh, also our Navy look into those alternatives? Okay, that was one question. Okay, and let's, wait, 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 let's take okay. them in order. Otherwise okay. it really gets confusing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, can we get it? Faster? This is Captain Meyer. So again, I don't think we can compare uh, specific sites from one location to another to, to Red Hill. And again, Red Hill provides a unique uh, protection that is not comparable to other uh, facilities. It's the same type of fuel though that we're looking at, a JP5 and also marine diesel. So it's same type of fuel. I think we should be able to do state of the art above ground tanks. Anyway, I wanna move on to my next question. Uh, I'm, I'm also concerned with like Melanie Lau and the rest regarding the, the 2045. Now we're hearing that we've got an AOC deadline and we have an HAR deadline. However, it's the Navy's request that I'm hearing for the 2045. And we don't, as far as I have aware, we don't have a DOH approval of that date. We don't have an e EPA approval of that date. So I, I don't think it's a valid date or it should be looked upon as a valid date. Another question, because I know I'm running out of time, with, our, with regards to GTTNA, uh, Gas Transport Telegas North America, how did they get the contract? How are they the professional or the leaders in secondary containment? Do they do U, USTs or do they do boats? I, I don't understand. And do they deal with fuel with what we're looking at? And all, also, what is an OTA? What is an other transaction, whatever that was? Is that a contract or is that not a contract? Is it by, uh, uh, was it uh, by an RFP or how did you come to this company and where are they located? Okay, plenty of questions in there. Can you go back, uh, uh, Gordy, and please answer as many of those as you can, looking for clarification on the GTT and a uh, contract and the sequence of activities. You Can you for add any further clarification, please? Yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll cover uh, the GTT and a effort. And so, uh, uh, GTTNA uh, was uh, reviewed through the Defense Innovation uh, Unit uh, to look at uh, available uh, technologies or technologies that existed that might be adapted to Department of Defense uses. And so after review of, uh, of many, uh, over a dozen uh, proposals, uh, this was the one selected that, could be, that was believed to truly be able to be adapt that technology to apply to Red Hill. Again, that technology does not exist today. Uh, GTTNA does uh, great work as an industry leader in the liquefied natural gas uh, storage system. Uh, they have done both tanks uh, ashore as well as uh, in vessels. Uh, so we, that's why we are in the feasibility and design stage trying to find how we can apply that promising technology that's used in one area to the fuel that is at Red Hill. And so that was done through an OTA, again, other transaction authority. Uh, it's not a, a contract, it's an agreement uh, that is not quite uh, like an RFP that you might see from a normal contract. So it's a unique way to quickly bring this technology on board and try to adapt it to our needs. Thank you for those clarifications. I wanna go over to Kyle, if you're not, uh, if you, and I see hands up, so take them down if you're not in line to ask a question or make a comment. So Kyle Kajihiro, thank you for being patient. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So I, I had a, a follow-up question on that GTT um, agreement. I've requested through FOIA that actual document and I haven't got any responses so far. I'm wondering how can we get a copy of the agreement to, to see the scope of work, timelines, deliverables, et cetera. And also, um, I think the public should also have a chance to review the contracts with the University of Hawaii um, Applied Research Center. So where are those uh, contracts and, and how can the public review those? Thank you. Are those public and, or can they be made public? Over to you, Gordy, to try to answer those. Yeah. 
Sure, the GTTNA agreement, again, is not a contract, it's an agreement. Uh, and so uh, it's not uh, uh, released a as a normal contract you might see uh, on different websites. Uh, regarding the University of Hawaii, uh, that information uh, is uh, obviously uh, with the University of Hawaii, and uh, we uh, are happy to uh, work with them in uh, releasing anything they deem appropriate uh, for the efforts they, they are doing. But you, you are a public uh, institution uh, spending taxpayer money with the University of Hawaii and with this GTTNA. Uh, those documents uh, to, should be made available, uh, even if it's not a, a, a uh, typical contract. Uh, I've been requesting documents and I haven't got any response. So how can you make those, if you're talking about transparency, please make those documents available so we can see what types of technologies you're researching. And Kyle, if I understood you, you filed FOIA requests on this? Uh, I, yes, I filed two FOIA requests and I still haven't gotten anything from uh, the Navy or DIU. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further comment, Gordy? Yeah, I will say on the GTTNA effort, uh, much of the documentation is proprietary uh, working with that company. And so we are, are careful to uh, ensure we maintain that uh, protection uh, of that company as they uh, partner with us going forward. Uh, regarding the University of Hawaii, um, uh, yes, uh, understand the question and we'll work to, uh, to uh, share uh, as much as uh, we believe is appropriate working with the University of Hawaii. So we may see those in the carryover items and the next time we meet as a FTAC. So those may come back up, I, I'm guessing they will. Uh, Melanie, I, can you take your hands down if you're not in line to speak or make a comment? And I can't see all of them. So Melanie, you're back up, I don't see others. Okay, so my question is in the interim between the last FTAC meeting and this FTAC meeting, um, there was a proposed schedule of having this FTAC meeting every six months and in between on a quarter and the quarter in between having the Navy update us. And so I did not get notice of any of those meetings, although Dr. I mean, sorry, um, Captain Meyer did mention that he released some kind of audio thing. And so I would like to know, well, I would like to get notice for one thing. And then second of all is, are we going to have those meetings? or not between the two FTEC meetings, thank you. So the, I, I'm not sure I understood that, Melanie. Are they, these are interim meetings or further audio? I'm, I'm not sure I understood your, your question. Um, no, they weren't audio from my understanding. It was like a, a memo to the FTEC committee that a proposed schedule, uh, you know, because it wasn't written in stone, was that between the two FTEC meetings, kind of at the three month interval, the Navy would give us an update on things like the GTTN, contracting, whatever, um, before these FTEC meetings, so we could have a more meaningful discussion instead of just having us updated now and everybody asking questions again and then saying, okay, well, it's still under investigation, et cetera. So, it would be nice if we did that before the next FTAC meeting. And that's my only point, thank you. I'm gonna invite DOH to comment or EPA and or Navy. So DOH, these meetings thank really happen under your comment. authorities. And thank you for that comment. Uh, the, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the first um, Zoom meeting for 2020 was recorded and that's available um, to the public. And the Navy has uh, posted an audio cast update on their website. That was between the October meeting and this meeting. Okay. So what? I need to actually troll the um, Navy site every day. So I would know about this audio update or it would be nice if maybe the Department of Health would send the committee members at least notification that this update is posted on their site. Thank you. So that's a request from on behalf of the committee, if I understand it, Melanie. So that you get notification of when those are available, when those updates are available. Yes, thank you. Okay, other questions or comments? I now feel know what it feels like to be an air traffic controller trying to manage 100 people on this thing. So, <laughs> But are there, are there other, I don't want to cut it off. I want to make sure everybody who wants to has a chance to either make a comment or ask a question. Yes, Peter, this is Charlie Ice. Thanks very much. Go ahead, Charlie. 
Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, no one has actually vetted GDT from a comparative point of view. And we have no idea why the Navy has selected them or whether they are a serious contender for solving this problem. And of course, the Navy is not going to tell us. Unfortunately, uh, we have no reason to trust what the Navy is doing about this. So, you know, it, that's all just it's hard, hard to judge any of that. Um, okay. Thank you, Charlie. Noted, so noted in the record here. Unless there's a comment back, anything further from Navy on this, on, on where the you know, vendors or competition to GTTNA? Uh, no additional comment than what I already stated that uh, we did a, a very thorough analysis on uh, selecting what we believed was uh, a technology that could be applied to the, to the tanks. And uh, working with that proprietary technology, we look forward to working with the regulators, uh, both DOH and EPA, as this progresses further for actual implementation. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Melody, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, again, I question GN GNTT because uh, according to uh, uh, Gordy Meyer, it indicates that they do natural gas and that they do boats, I believe, or but it's definitely not underground storage tanks and not uh, jet fuel or marine diesel. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing too is that uh, Red Hill supplies, of course, um, the loading at Pearl Harbor, the loading fuel at Pearl Harbor. And a lot of it is, is spent on RIMPAC, which is the biggest international maritime war games that's performed worldwide here in Hawaii. So I want to know how much fuel from Red Hill goes to those RIMPAC uh, marine games. This is Captain Meyer. So I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. Obviously, uh, with the uh, multiple ships uh, that arrive in Hawaii, uh, we support them. And uh, some of that fuel may come uh, from Red Hill. I do not have that exact number uh, available right now. Is that a findable number, though, Captain? Is that is that a number that can be secured or an estimation? Uh, I will look into that to, to see what what what, able, what we are able to determine what we, could, what we can provide. Good, thank you, uh, Melanie. Back to Melanie. Oh, hi. Sorry, um, I'm driving to the airport. So, anyway, uh, my question to the Navy is that since you consider the university students the best and the brightest, which I agree, and because they're young, they may think outside the box. I don't think there's any harm in putting it out to them as a project to design, implement, plan um, above ground tanks that are not over the aquifer. And also just to put it out to bid to private industry because money talks and you know we have the new Biden administration with the infrastructure bill and maybe it will also get Funded. Thank you. Thank you. Um, others? Any others? Ernie. Ernie Lau. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, just a question about the uh, recent release and how it relates to the uh, the Navy completed a quantitative risk analysis and uh, vulnerability assessment. Uh, by a company called ABS. And I, I thought I saw Mr. Liming, uh, the consultant uh, uh, in the meeting earlier. Uh, how does this most recent release on May 6 relate to the risk identified and assessed in the uh, ABS uh, quantitative risk and vulnerability assessment report? And this is a question maybe for Captain Myers. Uh, thank you. Yeah, at this time, I, I cannot speak uh, to how uh, this event and the risk vulnerability assessment compare. Obviously, when we complete the investigation, uh, we'll be able to better uh, do that review. And I think, Ernie, if I understood it, I'm not sure I did, but it's the linkage to the risk assessment. Yeah, the, uh, the report was done quite a while ago, and right. it's actually on the EPA and Department of Health's website. So epa.gov uh, uh, slash red dash hill, I think is the web URL. Um, and that report identified, I think the various risk uh, quantitatively calculated uh, for the facility. I think it may, I, and I'm just asking the question, did it include the pipelines, 
did address the uh, uh, vulnerabilities in the pipelines and how did that, uh, what was in the report done a while ago compare with the most recent event of May 6th? Good, thank you. So it's, it's a question of where this release, how, what you learned or didn't learn out of the risk assessment, whether the risk assessment forewarned or caught this, I think if I'm understanding it, so. You got it, Peter. Well, I'm trying to keep up with you guys. <laughs> uh, other questions or comments? I know that once I start to bring the meeting to a close, there will be a flood of hands coming up. So ask them now or make your comments now. Very extensive chat uh, record going on. Peter, a quick question. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think this is maybe for Department of Health. Uh, where do we go to find the the data from the Navy shaft, the water quality data? It, it, that's a question for DOH and or EPA. Is. Yeah, or EPA too. Well, I mean, yeah, it should be posted here, right? Yeah. Uh, Joanna? Charlie, okay. Charlie, is that the groundwater monitoring data? Yes, ma'am. It is on the um, Solid and Hazardous Waste Branch website. We will put that link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Melody, back to you. Thank you very one much. One question at a time, though, one question at a time. Okay, thank you, thank you. No, I want to go back to the risk assessment that uh, Ernie Lau has brought up uh, because the Navy has affirmed that there is a 34% chance of a major leak. Uh, what is what is the Navy consider a major leak? Hey, this is uh, Captain Myers. What's considered a major leak, I think, is outlined in that risk vulnerability assessment report, uh, which obviously is a large release, which uh, would impact uh, uh, the environment. And so that's what uh, uh, would be termed a large release that was uh, not able to be contained and uh, potentially affect uh, the environment, which we would then have to work to mitigate. Is there, uh, Captain, is there a number? Is there a quantitative one? Or is it just simply whether there's a a movement into the environment. I believe that that you know that exact number is still being developed as we look at uh, the different studies on uh, the groundwater flow model and uh, how that any release might transition uh, through uh, the geological uh, uh, st uh, structure that is under. Uh, and so I think that that exact amount uh, was considered large that may affect the environment is still under. Uh, part of our uh, efforts and reviews. So that may be another question we would like to have you come back and try to speak to when the FTAC meets again, because that's, uh, some of these questions you don't have a short answers to and immediate answers, but some of them may be uh, pulled in at the next, at the further meetings. Um, Here, may I also do a follow-up question? You sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The Navy's own analysis also indicated a 27.6% annual chance of a 30,000 gallon release. Uh, would that be considered a major release, 30,000 gallons? And then that also reverts back to the 2014 release of 27,000 gallons. Has that been located as to where the 27,000 gallons of, I guess, jet fuel would have gone? Is it in the groundwater? Has it touched the groundwater? Do we need to be concerned? Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Kat Meyer. So regarding the, the ground, so regarding the 27,000 gallon release from uh, 2014, uh, that has not been uh, detected in uh, the drinking water. Uh, drinking water reports for the entire time indicate it is safe. Uh, and so it has uh, any of that uh, 27,000 gallons uh, has not reach, reached uh, a level of concern at, to, to, to the drinking water. And has not been a concern. My can I, question can I, hang on, it's Melody. actually in the aquifer now. It's on the top of the aquifer right now. Char Charlie, can I go back to Ernie on that too? Is that uh, what your understanding is as well, Ernie? Uh, yeah, I think the uh, the data and this is maybe where the Navy 
might disagree with us. Uh, the fuel dissolved fuel constituents in the in the wells indicated a rise after the leak, not long after the leak of the 27,000 gallons in the groundwater below the tank. Um, where all that fuel went, that's still a, a question we don't know. Thank you. But it is at least clear to us that fuel did reach the groundwater. I mean, then the question, there are further questions about what was the harm where the, where the harm was. I understand your role. I get that completely. Other questions, other comments? I, you know, can I just say my goal for this is to have the leave with the highest levels of clarity we can get. And I understand there's a lot of things that are in motion and moving along. Uh, and some of these are very long and longer term studies as we've heard it. Uh, but that's the goal for these meetings is these are informational meetings. These are updates and informational meetings. So. Further questions, further comments? The floor remains, yes, Melody, I'm sorry, I may have cut off your second question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, again, um, a follow-up question then. Okay, is there anything that the Navy is doing in order to alleviate any further groundwater contamination from the 27,000 gallon leak? And then the other one, are there any plans in the event that we do have a major catastrophe and it does hit our aquifer. Are there plans to build a suitable desal facility that will support uh, the gap, or I should say the contaminated water and fill in that gap so that we'll have water? <laughs> Thank you. If I understand, I just wanna make sure I understood your question. The first part of it was, is there remediation systems? And the second part was, are there alternatives to the drinking water? Should it be contaminated? If that's how I heard it. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Peter. You bet. Captain Meyer. Yes, yeah, so there are, are, are is natural uh, attenuation and uh, breakdown of the fuel that, that is occurring uh, uh, for any uh, product or fuel that may have been released in, into the soil. So that, that is occurring uh, today. Uh, regarding uh, the question on the, the water, uh, potential water treatment, uh, so again, we, we look forward to uh, reaching an agreement uh, and uh, an agreed understanding uh, with uh, all parties and the regulators on uh, what potential mitigations uh, what can, that can be uh, potentially implemented, uh, including a potential water treatment plant and where uh, that might go. But again, uh, that is still a significant uh, discussion among uh, many uh, technical experts that we look forward to, uh, to resolving so uh, we can move forward. Others? The floor remains open, at least for a little while, but if I hear none, nobody else. I know there are a few people, Melody and Melanie and a few others who have many questions and would love more information. So the floor stays open if you have some. And that includes Kimo Frankel. <laughs> uh, this is our Ernie Peter. Go ahead. Uh, regarding a kind of a, the alternative of a, a treatment system to be installed there at Red Hill, should there be a release that a large, large release, uh, I, I believe, and I don't recall, uh, recall the exact year, but I recall, I think the Navy did a kind of a feasibility study uh, back around 2000, maybe 2008 or 2010. Uh, of a uh, system that could be installed at Red Hill. Uh, and I think they may have used uh, activated carbon. Uh, they came up with some initial capital costs to install the system and also an estimate of the ongoing uh, operation maintenance costs. Uh, I don't recall the exact date of that report, but it's been a while. I think it was late 2000s. So there is some sort of a remediation uh, idea or plan or something out there, but I think it's been looked at before. Maybe Captain Myers can uh, provide more precise information about that report. Gordy, do you have more information on that? Yeah. I can't uh, speak about the to the two thousand eight or nine information. I don't have that readily available off the top of my head, but but I do know we we've looked at uh, you know uh, potential. Uh, water treatment uh, facilities and uh, what might those costs be if we can come to an agreement on, on how that might be implemented and where it would be installed and how that would, would affect the groundwater flow. 
Okay. Other questions, other comments? Sure, I'll have a question, Peter. Go ahead. Um, so I wanna know if the Navy is committed to complying with the dates laid out in the AOC and the Hawaii administrative rules for upgrading their tanks to uh, secondary treatment, uh, sorry, secondary containment uh, by 2037 or 2038, depending on how you count. Um, because all we hear from the Navy is about 2045. I wanna know if the Navy's com committed to complying with state law and the AOC. So yes, this is, yeah, this is Captain Myron. So yes, uh, Navy is committed to the AOC and complying with the AOC. Uh, we are also, as with any uh, Hawaii administrative regulation, are uh, will comply as appropriate with those as well. The twenty, uh, Captain Meyer, the twenty forty five date, which I think you, uh, Steve, and others have said, is uh, uh, verbal. It's a verbal commitment that has been made. I don't know that it's in writing yet, or if it is, maybe it's recorded in these meetings. But that is beyond the the. A the 2045, I'm not expressing myself very well. The 2045 date is the time it takes to do the secondary containment feasibility and implementation. Is that why it's pegged at 2045 as opposed to 2038, 2037, which is in the AOC? But what's the, what's the rationale for 2045? I think that's what, that's how I understand Kimo's question. Yeah. 2045 is the Navy's commitment to, to secondary containment. Obviously, there is no technology today that, that meets that uh, requirement, but uh, we believe that we can uh, work forward together uh, to achieve that and have that implemented by 2045. Uh, we also uh, plan to fully comply with the AOC uh, and requirements that are outlined uh, by 2037. So, Peter, can I clarify something really quick? Sure. Yeah, so I think one thing I think you want to make sure is clear is the AOC 2037 date is for what, what is considered best available practicable technology. So it's not, it, 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 you know, it not could be secondary containment if that's considered best available practicable technology. I think what you heard from the Navy today is they don't think secondary containment is available today as a retrofit for those tanks. And that's why they're doing this GTT study. Um, it, so, so our AOC deadline is not, you know, it, it is not explicitly secondary containment by that date. It's BAPT by that date. The, the um, Hawaii regulations um, state secondary containment or an alternative protective approach you know, uh, uh, approved by the uh, director of health. And so the 2045 date the Navy's put out there as a goal in our minds is the only kind of explicit kind of date for, you know, you know, either secondary containment or shutdown. So there's, there's a potential for something less or different than secondary containment under both the AOC and the, the Hawaii Rail. So I think one of the things that's going to need some clarification, if not sooner, later, in, in our, by our next meeting or by any interim meetings about these dates and what they mean, because I think there's confusions out there amongst the public and uh, we, we, we need some clarification. Public needs clarification. The committee needs clarification. Right. I think one other thing, Peter, I want to point out is Please. the, you know, the AOC is not just focusing on the tank vessel itself. It's a, focusing on the facility as a whole and looking for kind of where, what can be done in terms of risk mitigation in order to improve protection of the groundwater. Because as, as we've seen at UST facilities all across the country, you know, tanks can leak, but a lot of times it's piping, it's valves, it's overfills, it's human errors. There's all kinds of things that can cause a release. So we're looking more under the AOC more holistically at the facility, not just at the tank vessel. That's and, good, and you know, I think that uh, the concern over kind of corrosion holes developing in the steel liner it, it, it is, is, is a very uh, important concern. You know, those aren't necessarily going to lead to a catastrophic failure, but, you know, pipeline breach in the lower tunnel 
could lead to a much larger catastrophic failure. So we want to be looking at everything under the AOC. And that's the purview of the AOC, the whole facility, not just the tanks. Okay. Um, who else? Charlie. Hello, Peter. I, I, uh, yeah, well, this is hand is still up, so I don't know whether you're, it's an old question or a new one, but we'll come back to you. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a to follow up on the, the water quality reporting for the Navy shaft. <clears throat> uh, what I have seen so far does not uh, indicate any of the uh, the, the materials that that appear after the breakdown, we know that the fuel, when it uh, gets into the <clears throat> into the soil, into the rock, it starts to break down a little bit. And there are things, constituents of that jet fuel, that are kind of scary for public health. Um, I see no way that they are actually tracking any of that kind of stuff. And our concern would be that those people are actually drinking that uh, some of those constituents right now and and there isn't any way to track them. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Kimo, are your hand is still up? Do you have another question? No. Take your hand down there if you would. Thank you. Um, other comments, other questions? I'm gonna bring this to a close otherwise very shortly. Thank you. Sorry, Joanna. Thank you for that comment, please. So the, the Department of Health is requiring the Maybe to monitor and sample for some of those constituents that you are alluding to. Uh, we are monitoring that closely because we want to make sure that we are providing um, safe drinking water to the community. Good. All right. I think I will begin to bring us to a close here. And unless there's any last minute urgent questions or comments. There's a lot in the chat record that will get preserved. The recording will get preserved. I want to just thank everybody for showing up. Um, and I just want to say that again, remind you that the goal of these meetings is not necessarily to, to argue out a resolution to the issues. It is clarity. A lot of work is going on. A lot of it is still to be done. Uh, and I understand that. And I appreciate the civility and the courtesies that you have expressed here. And uh, I thank the DOH for hosting these meetings, which you're doing. And uh, let's bring it to a close. I've, I've always heard from everybody that the best meetings in the world end early. <laughs> so we will do that. Yes, Joanna, go ahead. Do you want to have some final comments? Yes, please. Two, go ahead. Oh, okay. So before we adjourn, I just want to talk about next, uh, meeting, the next meeting. Um, well, actually, I wanted to say that we, we did skip a few agenda items. If everybody's okay with that, um, we can continue. Um, it sounds like the GCTNA um, discussion is going to continue to the next meeting as well because people are still asking for the meeting. Okay. Um, so if that's the case, then we'll, we'll just continue. Um, basically, our next meeting is going to be tentatively around September 10th. Um, sorry, the so September time frame, and um, again, the video recording of this meeting plus the chat, um, the comments that are in the chat will be available um, publicly as well. Um, so in between now and September, the Navy will probably do another update of some sort. If it is an audio cast, um, I'll be sure to forward it to the FTAC members this time, and I think that's it. And you can email me um, if you need some additional information. Um, my email is 2thu.perry, P-E-R-R-Y, at doh.hawaii.gov. And that's it for me. Peter. Joanna, you want to yeah. give her any final closing comments, Joanna? I appreciate all the comments, and we are taking that into consideration. We take the health and environment of the state of Hawaii very seriously, and we want to make sure that we address all of the concerns that we hear from our community. So thank you for attending and participating. Thanks, everybody, and have a good day. Good job, Peter. Mahalo. Thanks, Peter. You're welcome.
<laughs> My oh. job's easy compared <laughs> to you guys. Yeah. Uh, continue the discussion. Thanks. See you, Steve. <laughs>